twice last year. Egypt dazzled the world with spectacular displays of ancient Egyptian culture. At the very heart of Egyptian identity, a lavish multi-million dollar historic procession befitting royalty with pomp and circumstance, the country's ancient rulers, 3,000 year old mummified remains of 22 kings and queens were relocated from where they had resided for more than a century to a new museum in the outskirts of Cairo. In Egypt, history matters. This is a country that for 3,000 years under the pharaohs was one of the world's predominant superpowers. And for every Egyptian I've ever met, this history is a source of immense pride. It is hardwired into their cultural consciousness, intricately bound up with their sense of self. It was not only the grand scale of the celebrations that made these events stand out, but also the songs sung in the old Egyptian language, understood today mostly by Egyptologists. Many Egyptians themselves had never heard their ancient language before, and Arabic subtitles had to be provided for the television broadcasts. That said, there are questions about the nature of Egypt's identity today its own perception of itself, its national identity. As such, the issue has serious political and cultural implications. The North African country has two strands of national heritage. First is the purely Egyptian, which draws inspiration from ancient Egypt, and second, the Arabized or Islamized Egyptian. Notice there is no mention about a national heritage drawn from the Egyptians considering themselves Africans. Are schools in Egypt not teaching African history? You see, being Arab is not an alternative to being African or even being black. So why not be both and embrace the duality of both worlds? Anyway, that's a story for another day. Egyptians have long conducted an intense national debate about what Egypt is, what it stands for, and its place in the world. However, this conversation has always been conducted within the backdrop of an authoritarian and dictatorial political system. Former presidents Gamal Abdel Nasser, Anwar Sadat, and Hosni Mubarak used narratives that they hoped would stir the loyalty of large numbers of Egyptians. The country has today lurched from a vaguely socialist poster child of the third world to the late Cold War strategic partner of the United States to the emerging market darling of Wall Street, all in the pursuit of national power, prosperity and peace. None of these narratives, however, managed to bridge the gap between what Egyptians were being told about their lives and how they actually experienced them. I believe that this is why the current regime led by President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi capitalized on the return to ancient Egypt of past glory days. The promotion of ancient Egypt as a national identity would bind Egyptians together and take apart the divisive narrative of political Arabism and Islam, which portrays Egyptians in exclusively Islamic and Arabic terms. The long dominant themes of Arabism and Islam still exist and have a strong place in the country, but appears to no longer serve an end or purpose. More about this in a bit. Let us first answer the question why this country, which appears to be toning down on Arabism, have the Arab Republic of Egypt as its official name. Let me take you back in time. We know that the Suez Canal separates the bulk of Egypt from the Sinai Peninsula. In 1854, France secured an agreement with the Ottoman governor of Egypt to build the canal. An international team of engineers drew up the construction plan and two years later, the Suez Canal Company was formed and granted the right to operate the canal for 99 years after completion of the work. 
By slicing through the slim stretch of land connecting Africa to Asia, the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea were joined, and it was opened for international trade and travel in 1869. So crucial was this 194-kilometer or 120-mile passage to international trade that the British quickly bought up a third of all shares. A few years later in 1882, the British lived up to their reputation by invading Egypt and taking control of everything, beginning a long occupation of the country. By the 1950s, the Arab side of Egyptian identity had become inextricably linked to President Gamal Abdel Nasser, the first real Egyptian to rule the country in well over 2,000 years, from the 4th century BC until the 1952 coup that brought President Nasser to power. Egypt had effectively been in the hands of foreign dynasties. He had a special dislike for imperial powers and had sworn to force their troops out. But the planned construction of the Aswan High Dam across the Nile desperately required financial backing from the West. At first, President Nasser was happy to play the USA and the USSR against each other. But he eventually overplayed his hand when he accepted communist arms into Egypt, which resulted to the Americans pulling out of the Aswan High Dam project. In retaliation, he nationalized the Suez Canal in 1956, wrestling control of the all-important infrastructure from the British and French-controlled Suez Canal Company. London and Paris were furious. I mean, how dare he nationalize an asset that is within his own country's borders? The two powers agreed that they would take back the Suez Canal and ensure that Nasser was removed from power. But outright military action was not a viable option. This was because not only would the United Nations never agree to it, but the British and French people were against going to war. Conard, they secretly lobbied Israel to stage an invasion and assume control of the canal, providing the pretext for them to step in as peacemakers. The reason this sounds so familiar is because we've seen this chess move played over a hundred times over the last 20 years alone. So, just as planned, Israel invaded in late October and British and French troops landed in early November and occupied the Canal Zone. Under pressure from the United Nations, Britain and France withdrew in December and Israeli forces departed in March 1957. So, that is how President Nasser almost single-handedly steered Egypt away from the European sphere of influence and thrust it into the heart of Arab politics. He became a popular heroic figure throughout the Arab world following the Suez Crisis, where he stood up to Britain and France. Nasser quickly assumed the mantle as the Arab world leader, and he started pursuing the dream of pan-Arab unity. He formed a new country, the United Arab Republic, a sovereign state that came to be by merging Egypt and Syria. However, the political union with Syria dissolved just three years later in 1961, following a coup d'etat in Syria who were forced to pull out of the union. Egypt did not drop the Union's name and continued to be known officially as the United Arab Republic, or UAR for short, until 1971, when they finally changed the name to what it currently is, the Arab Republic of Egypt. Even though President Nasser passed on in 1970 through what was described as a heart attack, he is regarded as the one who made Egypt officially Arab. Today, more than 50 years since his passing, the Egyptian constitution has enshrined the two pillars of Egypt's supposedly Arab Muslim identity. Arabic is the official language and Islam is the state religion. Now, this is where things get dicey. People assume because Egypt was invaded by Arabs and mostly speak Arabic, then they are ethnic Arabs. While the assumption that conquest and choice of language automatically changes the genetics of populations itself is absurd, 
because from that very assumption, you would be correct to say that Indians are British or that Iranians are Arabs or that Greeks, Serbians and Bulgarians are Turks or that Kurds are Arabs, all because they were conquered by those nations in their history. Therefore, the assumption that Egypt is exclusively culturally Arab is more absurd. Look at it this way. Scots don't call themselves English. West Africans whose countries were once colonized by France don't call themselves French, though like Egypt they speak the language of their colonizer. So why do most Egyptians identify as Arab despite factual evidence to the contrary, including recent DNA analysis that shows that they are no more than 20% Arab? The recent pharaonic spectacles on the streets of Cairo have been interpreted by many as President Sisi's attempt to resurrect Egyptian as opposed to Arab nationalism because it taps into the pride that many Egyptians genuinely feel about their ancient history, especially those who see themselves excluded from the discourse of Arabism and Islamism, such as Egypt's Coptic Christian minority. Developing a distinct awareness of Egyptian identity may help curtail the influence of Islamism and Pan-Arabism. You see, this is more than a dispute about political systems. It is an emotional debate that cuts to the core of being Egyptian. Arabism entangled Egypt in Pan-Arab conflicts with devastating effect. Whether this was the wars with Israel or the disastrous intervention of the Egyptian army in the Yemeni civil war in the 60s. When Egypt signed a peace deal with Israel in 1979, it effectively turned its back on Arabism and became more focused on its own problems. Meanwhile, the twin brother of Arabism, that is political Islam or Islamism, has been declared for a while now the official enemy of the Egyptian state. Its foremost proponent, the Muslim Brotherhood, was outlawed and designated a terrorist organization, and its president, Mohamed Morsi, ousted in 2013. This is yet another twist of the unfolding drama of national identity in Egypt. As an official Arab state, Arabic is the official language of the country, but in reality, Egyptians use two languages classical Arabic and the Egyptian vernacular, which is a hybrid of Arabic and the kind of Egyptian spoken when the Arabs conquered Egypt in the 7th century. The first is the language used in official matters, but the vernacular has over the centuries become the language of everything else. You don't have to take my word for it. Abu Golayel, regarded as one of the most important new voices in Egypt's Ministry of Culture, Egypt's salvation lies in being close to its Egyptianness. I'm not against the Arabs, but Egypt is different from the Arabs and older than the Arabs. Attaching Egypt to a pan-Arab entity as if she was part of it has been extremely damaging. There you go guys, I would like to thank our great supporters on Patreon whose generous contributions allow us to keep expanding and creating more high quality content. If you'd like to help out with the channel, please head over to patreon.com slash reasonafrica. That's patreon.com slash reasonafrica. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then you'll definitely enjoy the ones on the screen right now. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.